हमने आतंकवादियों को घर में घुसकर मारा भारत ने पाकिस्तान की धमकी से डरने की नीति को छोड़ दिया अगर आपके पास कोई एक्शनेबल इंटेलिजेंस है कि पाकिस्तान इन्वॉल्व है वो हमें दे मैं आपको गारंटी करता हूं कि हम एक्शन लेंगे सो मोस्ट ऑफ द मॉडर्न डे प्रॉब्लम बिटवीन इंडिया एंड पाकिस्तान can be traced down to one issue and that's the issue of Kashmir and cross border terrorism that emanates from Pakistan and that has cost so many Indian lives over the last many decades the idea behind this video is to try and take a step back and look at the origins and the history of this Kashmir dispute enthusiastic crowds thronged the streets and welcomed Nehru now the prime minister of an independent nation Nehru's popularity with the Indian people was one of the reasons his mentor Mahatma Gandhi had chosen him to lead the Congress party during the negotiations which led to independence. It goes back all the way to the time of independence to 1947 when both India and Pakistan got freedom. The concept of the two nation theory, the idea that Hindus and Muslims fundamentally are different people and therefore cannot coexist and therefore each of them needs a separate country which was first proposed by the Muslim League and Muhammad Ali Jinnah eventually it was brought in by Mahatma Gandhi and the International Congress so you had two separate countries you had one country for the Muslims Pakistan and one country for the Hindus which was India In the middle of this is this kingdom of Kashmir which is unique in and of itself because it happens to be a Muslim majority kingdom but ruled by a Hindu king. So Pakistan considers Kashmir as the unfinished business of the partition. So what happens is the Pakistan army uses these tribal raiders in 1947 they are sent in to capture to forcibly annex the kingdom of kashmir and they come up all the way down to the outskirts of srinagar which is when the hindu king of uh, the princely state of kashmir maharaja hari singh sends an sos to delhi to which nehru responds and says yes i'm willing to send the indian army and to save your kingdom but you have to sign the instrument of accession So the king agrees he signs the instrument of accession and even as this document is being ferried back to Delhi Nehru gives orders to airlift the Indian troops the Indian troops are then flown in then it becomes a full blown war between India and Pakistan this in fact is the first war between both countries eventually India wins the war there is a ceasefire agreement and the terms of that ceasefire agreement are outlined in what is now famously known as the UN Security Council Resolution 1948 now the Security Council Resolution the main part of it is that there has to be a plebiscite for the people of Kashmir and they will get to determine what their future is going to be should they be with India should they be with Pakistan or should they uh, declare independence but the interesting thing with this with this security council resolution is that it orders three steps and it orders very specifically that these three steps have to be sequential in order and the first step in that sequence is that pakistan must withdraw all its troops the second step is that india must withdraw its troops but india is allowed as per the wording of that security council resolution to keep a residual number of troops a minimal number of troops so as to be able to defend her territory and the third step is this plebiscite now the pakistanis when they always refer to the 1948 security council resolution they don't talk about step 1 or step 2 they go directly to step 3 problem is the resolution itself says the steps have to be sequential so you can't have step 3 directly you have to have step 1 then step 2 and then step 3 This first war ended in victory for India so did all the other three wars that India and Pakistan have fought they fought in 65 they fought in 71 and they fought in 99 in Kargil the most decisive of course was the 1971 war because it led to the creation of uh, Bangladesh what used to be East Pakistan uh, eventually got independence and it became the new country of Bangladesh what it also did this 1971 war was to completely demolish this idea of a two nation theory so what the pakistan army realized particularly after the defeat of the 1971 war was that in a conventional war you cannot challenge the indian army the indian army is way more powerful and way more sophisticated so you can't beat them uh, in a conventional war so what happened when general zia was the head of pakistan through much of the 70s is that they discovered this whole new idiom called bleeding india by a thousand cuts which is 
to enable the so-called Mujahideen or freedom fighters, give them weapons, give them logistical help and send them across the border and essentially indulge in guerrilla warfare. So they did that through much of the 80s and 90s in Kashmir, basically uh, enabling groups like the Hezbollah Mujahideen, the Jesh e Mohammed, the Lashkar e Taiba to carry out terrorist attacks across the border in Kashmir and in other parts of mainland India. Now, the question is, why does Pakistan do this? Pakistan is a classical security-seeking state. It's a small country. It's a poor country. How is it that such a country has an army which is so large, which takes up so much of the resources of this country? The Pakistan army's military budget, for example, is about $12 billion. Its military budget is roughly about 5% of its GDP. For a country that's that small, whose economy is that small, who has such a large number of poor people, it is absolutely inexplicable why they need such a large army. Pakistan military is no longer just a, a defending force. It is actually a business conglomerate. The Pakistan army is involved in all kinds of businesses, from making movies to food processing, what have you. So the reason for existence, the raison d'etre of the Pakistan army, is the threat from India. That's how they justify their inflated budgets. And that's how they've been going to the US and to countries in Europe and asking for money. Because since 1998, when both countries officially went nuclear, this has been the greatest trick that the Pakistan army and the Pakistan uh, deep state has been pulling off, that if these nuclear weapons fall in the wrong hands, that is in the hands of these uh, terrorists, then it would be pretty much the end of uh, uh, the world as we know it. So this is a fear that they have been playing on both vis-a-vis -vis the US State Department as well as their benefactors in Europe and in the Muslim world that if these weapons fall into the wrong hands, then it will be a nuclear catastrophe in India. Now, the final part of this uh, question is, how does India deal with this? Now, had India and Pakistan not gone nuclear, had it been left to just a conventional military solution, then India would have solved this problem uh, a very long time ago. Because, like I said, there have been four wars that have been fought conventionally. All four, India has won. The problem when you bring nuclear weapons into this question is uh, the scales are tilted slightly more uh, in favor of Pakistan. So what does India do? I think what India has demonstrated with the Balakot airstrikes, the surgical strikes before that, is that there are options. There are military options which are sub-nuclear. It, it means that not every attack or not every skirmish uh, between the two countries could naturally lead uh, up the escalatory ladder, eventually leading to some kind of a nuclear confrontation between both countries. That there are sub-nuclear options available, including the airstrikes and other surgical strikes, where you can uh, ferret out this problem of terrorism and terrorists and attack that and separate that from attacking uh, the sovereign territory of Pakistan. Now, this is one of the options that has been put out there on the table. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if India can come up with more options to deal specifically with this problem of terrorism.